I remember very clearly the first words a Klingon ever spoke to me. Patlaku! Kapu! Which, incredibly, translates to, We've been trying to reach you about your ship's extended warranty. What can I say? It was 0200, I was tired, I made some bad decisions. But in light of the Klingons making a resurgence in the Strange New World Season 2 trailer, one of which is definitely enjoying a drinking game with our dear Mr. Spock, I'd like to think it's safe to say we will be getting a look at at least one of their vessels. We've been treated to the Star Trek Discovery ships of the Klingon Empire, which directly overlaps with Strange New World's crew, but despite that, the D7 is also canon in that crazy reason for their looking different fleet. And seeing as how they're active in the Dunny Prize era, what better time to have a look at something other than another next, 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 next best enterprise. If you want to see that, then please feel free to rewatch the Titan A video and just imagine I'm saying Enterprise G. Or alternatively, you can stay here while I attempt to speak Klingon at you terribly. Kavek! Nuknek Trek Central Petak! Yinta! Toja! Ha <laughs> Gintak Madman! Zu! Dilak Do! Kigosh! As always, before we warp into this video, I'm going to throw off those of you who like to sing along with the usual call to action and simply say like, comment, subscribe, follow socials for daily updates, blah de blah de blah. And also, my back tag, the writer, would like to apologize for the glaring mistake on the placement of the third torpedo launcher on the Enterprise D. That goof slipped through so many webs, the Tholians are demanding a refund. Cash. So please, as always, give us your thoughts, any and all feedback and ideas in the comments, because if you're talking Trek, then we want to hear about it. Da! Jetla! And because Ermagerd video time doesn't translate well into Klingon, let's go with the much more traditional Chik Chu! Zhaz Vam! Zhaz Kak! Mak Cha! Da! The D7. Initially presented to the High Council by Chancellor Lorel in 2257, intended to enter mass production, be a symbol of unity and embraced by all houses. By the 2260s, the Sevens were the most common type of vessel within the Klingon Imperial fleet. Though not yet manifested on screen, the D6 class, which almost cosmetically was indistinguishable from its successor, was considered dated and relegated to light cruiser roles and other variants. One of the very first D7s ferried Chancellor Mommy, er, uh, Lorel, to Boreth to meet with the USS Donny Prize. Predatory in its appearance, with a spread wing engineering hull and a head like command pod, the bulk of the ship's overall mass was at the aft section, separated by an access corridor along a rather thin neck to the forward section. Much like the layout of Starfleet ships, the Klingons too like to have their bridge as obvious and exposed as possible. To offset this, though, there are very few windows, at least, all situated at the foremost of the primary hull, leaving the rest of the ship to be covered with hull plating. Approximately 228 meters in length, 168 meters in width, and at a height of 60 meters, give or take a few micrometers, totaling 18 decks. I can imagine a commanding officer getting a bit pissed when his mate's one is a smidge bigger than his. Uh, uh, the D7, that is. Not the... You know. The D7 had a crew with an excess of 440, give or take a few togs, and other living dinner options. Mid to late 2260s, we saw them also being used by the Romulan Empire as well, which is a bold move. Just a touch of beta cannon. The Romulan variants are called Stormbird class, pretty decent name, which was absolutely not ripped off from Warhammer 40,000 in any way, shape, or form. The Romulan versions had birds of prey detailing on the hull, much like their bird of prey way back when. Fitted with S2 graph units, a rough equivalent to the Federation's warp drives, they were capable of speeds of warp 9, making them an arse clenching baddie to be very afraid of when attempting to outrun them. Their impulse engines were split into four. There were two just below the shuttle hangar and one on either wing, you know, just in case one of those things gets exploded for some reason. As standard, the D7 vessels possessed defensive shielding, but it was their offensive power that made them truly dangerous. The considerable firepower at their disposal were, of course, including forward-mounted phaser emitters, nacelle-mounted disruptor cannons, a photon launcher in the gaping gob at the front, and the launcher at the back between the two impulse engines. They were even capable of firing magnetic pulses, which looked like a ball of light. 
which could cause extensive damage to ships, even with their shields up. So essentially a kaboomy that is effective against shields. And yes, for those who play STO, that probably means they were tacky on base, but there's nothing to confirm that on screen, so shut up. And then there was that one time the IKS divisor wielded a projected stasis field, but with prolonged use, it would quickly drain the battlecruiser's power cells, greatly reducing their battle capacity. In order to complete an ongoing assault, the weapon would take several hours to fully charge. It was eventually determined to be impractical in standard combat. Disruptors were primarily green pulses, or sometimes beams. Phasers emitted red beams. Torpedoes were also red sparkly lights, and the pulses are white and blue. The stasis fields also had a rather standard whiteness to them. By 2268, they were equipped with cloaking devices, which were exchanged with the Romulans for several D7s as a part of their short-lived alliance. Now, this may seem like an amazing tactical exchange, but let's face it, when the plot demands, they're pretty easy to circumvent. All you really need is a data. You play around with some buttons and or a warhead turned homing torpedo, which can seek out plasma coils. And the D7 class in particular could be penetrated by metaphasic sweeps. Fire. 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 I know, I know, that was a bird of prey, but you get my point. It's required by the script. Their cloaks were sh**. Almost like that scene in Lord of the Rings, where Frodo has to throw his cloak over Sam to make them look like a rock, except there's a giant gaping hole in the cloak where his arse is. On the topic of arses, there's a shuttle hangar on the D7 located in the aft section, surrounded by cooling vanes for some reason. One on either side, and another facing forward, acting as an emergency reactor cooling vane. Another detail common to Starfleet as well is that the nacelles are attached on outriggers, or as we call them, pylons, away from the main hull. This is in keeping with the thought that they give off harmful radiation and needed to be kept away from the livable area of the ships. That would also make it stand to reason that considerable shielding, such as on other ships like the awesome and totally undefeatable Defiant, is employed. We don't speak about the Second Battle of Chintoka. Nobody even knows what Shintaka is. Or that the advancements in warp engine design greatly reduces, if not completely negates, any and all radiation, including gamma. Which is good, because we wouldn't want anyone hulking out in a pressurized metal container in the middle of outer space, would we? What would that even be called, anyway? A Hulklingon? A Klingolk? A Hon. Yes, a Hon. I'm going to go with that one. Klingon ships are also very sparse. There's very little in the way of luxury, save for the copious amounts of blood wine and gah! Which, to be honest, is probably par for the course. After all, they need to look harder! So they probably couldn't care less that they passed out on hard bunks devoid of covers and pillows and probably executed anyone in possession of a doily. Accepting, of course, that the doily maker then takes offense to this particular accusation, removes both of the knitting needles from the doily and jabs the other person square in the eyes. I kebabs. A Han's favorite food. I feel like I'm coming up with an entire episode of Lower Decks here. Save for the dining tables, the captain's chair, and the pivoting tactical stations on some classes of ships, all stations were standing, on the bridge and in the reactor pit. It would be seen that sitting is a luxury reserved for the commanding officers only. Like, can you imagine if there was a Klingon commander out there that spoke like that? I would watch that. Launched as a battlecruiser, making up the backbone of the fleet, the D-7 posed a significant security threat to the Federation throughout the 2270s. This was when there was an ongoing Cold War between the two powers, which dated back to at least 2223. In 2267, a build-up of tensions led to a brief, yet all-out war over Organia, a key strategic planet between the Federation and Klingon space. The USS Enterprise... The first one was dispatched to prevent the Klingons using Organia as a base of operations. En route, a D-7 caused damage to decks 10 and 11 of the Enterprise, but in retaliation with a 100% dispersal of their phaser banks, the Enterprise completely smashed the Klingon ship to smithereens. A single ship was usually easy enough for the Enterprise to take on alone, but when a fleet of them, 
upward of seven battle cruisers arrived after Kirk and Spock beamed to the planet, they would clearly be too much for the Enterprise, forcing it to retreat. Luckily, the Organians revealed themselves to be a highly evolved species and brought the hostilities to a swift end. Kor was a commander of one of the ships that led an invasion force of over 500 Klingons in the occupation of Organia. Kor, 20 years after, became close friends with Curzon Dax, Federation Ambassador to Kronos, and later Dax's subsequent host, Jadzia. The D7s also occasionally were used as scout ships, which is just a tiny bit of overkill, in my opinion, for a battle cruiser. Well, who are we to argue? Though Klingons aren't strangers to ruthlessness in order to get the job done, and let's face it, overkill is pretty much a shared Klingon trait. Why send a bird of prey if you've got a battle cruiser going spare? Destroy all unknown anomalies! Is an order I can picture them giving a lot. The IKS Goroth, captained by Koloth, visited Deep Space Station K7 once upon a time, whilst harboring a spy, Arn Darvin, who was in collusion with the captain to poison a shipment of grain bound for Sherman's planet. What a weird name for a planet. Only when there was an outbreak of the Klingon arch nemesis, the fluffballs known as Tribbles, cursed be their name, began to eat the grain and die which exposed the plot and served to defuse the almost renewed hostilities with the Federation, which, I think, makes them heroes. Which also begs the question, where exactly on a Tribble do you pin a Christopher Pike Medal of Valor? Answer in the comments, folks. A future Darwin, under the guise of the horrible <laughs> name of Barry Waddle, sought revenge for the foiled attempt all that time ago. The USS Defiant was sent back in time this time to the very same incident so that Darwin could plant a bomb on K7 inside a Tribble. That alternate crisis was, of course, subverted, unbeknownst to those old scientists, and Darwin was exposed as before. I would have paid real money for there to have been a line when he stands there shaking his fist at Kirk and McCoy going, and I'd have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for you meddling kids. Ah, what a lost opportunity. A D7 class was sent to intercept Enterprise when the Klingons decided they didn't want an alliance to be forged between two worlds, Elas and Troyus, with the marriage of their respective leaders. Commander Kang's D7, which we will call the IKS Kang, because it was devoid of a canonical name, was the first Klingon ship of the 23rd century to have a female, Mara, the ship's science officer on board, who happened to be Kang's wife. At least one D7 was still active all the way forward to 2377, a multi-generational ship carrying a religious sect that had left the Klingon Empire in the mid-23rd century on a quest to the Delta Quadrant. The ship was destroyed by the commander, Kolar, in order to stay aboard Voyager to witness the birth of Tom and Belana's child, whom he believed to be the Kuvamach, or Saviour. The class remained in service for some time, but they were slowly being replaced by 2371 with the Katinga class, a very similar in appearance, though running about 349.54 meters in length, a massive 121.54 meters longer, and were crewed with around 800 personnel. Weapons were increased because of course they were to six-phase disruptor cannons to complement the two torpedo launchers and experimental concussive weapons. Before the signing of the Kittimer Accords in 2293, a Katinga-class ship suddenly dropping its cloak would be the most feared sight in the Quadrant, as few ships could match its tactical capabilities. Designer Matt Jeffries designed the D7 for the original series to be able to square up to the Enterprise, though bizarrely, a Klingon ship was never seen on screen until Star Trek's third season, making a brief appearance at the end of the episode Elan of Troyus in which the Klingons only play a peripheral role. The designation of D7 was also never referred to in TOS, not until the 30th anniversary DS9 episode Trials and Tribulations, where Major Kira identified the vessel at Station K7 as a D7 battle cruiser, which itself had to be remade for that particular episode, appearing to be more detailed than the original, given that the budget for DS9 hadn't been slashed to bare bones like Season 3 of Kirk's era had been. Luckily, AMT, the company that produced the model kits for the 1701 Enterprise, wanted a follow-up to that ship due to selling over 1 million kits in the first year. 
Even though a Klingon ship is something that would fit the show, it was primarily done for AMT. Under the deal that AMT struck with the show's producers, they paid for the design and development of the ship that would become the D7 battlecruiser scout ship of HOLY CRAP THAT'S FAST! Jeffries was basically left to his own designs when it came to how it looked. AMT had no involvement whatsoever. He designed it at home due to having no time or the money to do it at the studio. He had no idea what the shape would be, but he saved the odd sketch, having hundreds of balled up pieces of paper already in his bin. In his own words, it's like when you make a mistake in arithmetic and you go back over the same piece of paper and keep making the same dumb mistakes. You've got to throw it away and start from scratch. Many basic elements were the same, such as the twin warp nacelles, a clear engineering and command hull, and eventually drawing inspiration from aquatic creatures. The Klingons are wicked, so something with killer potential that would look wicked needed to be there. Though the basis was the manta ray, even though they're not dangerous, many people think they look vicious, yet graceful when they swim. With that and coloration of a shark, grayish green on top and lighter gray underneath, that set him on course. The master models were close to 18 inches across, built using a pantograph. One end had a stylus that traced the master model, and at the other end was a tool that carved out the same shape in tooling steel. One of these models was used to create a number of effect shots for its debut in Elan of Troyes, but to save money, the same model was used again to show a Romulan vessel in the Enterprise incident, explaining that the Romulans and Klingons had formed an alliance and were sharing technology. By the time the motion picture rolled around in 1978, the D7s were upgraded to the Katinga class. The Enterprise got a new look, so so did they. They kept the same overall shape, but added more surface detail, mostly around the bridge and nacelles, and changed the hull paneling on all surfaces to make it more bird-like. The shape of the D7 would later influence the majority of the designs for the Klingon fleet, such as my personal favorite, the Negvar class warships, as well as the Vorcha, the D5, for example. The sarcophagus, or ship of the dead, command vessel for the house of Tukuvma, echoed a similar layout. Where the bird of prey designs came from, no bugger knows. I personally like to think that they were just looking out the window and saw a pigeon madly flapping around trying to get off a power cable line and thought, hmm, yes, that with armor. But that about wraps up the D7 battlecruisers and a tease at the Katinga. It's always been a great shame to me that these ships never really got much on screen time. Well, let's hope all that changes with the new Paramount Plus sized budget and we get some more Klingon ships to gawp over because let's face it, Star Trek wouldn't be what it is without the masterfully made, and some ugly, ships that the creative minds have through the ages given us across 60 years. As for you, if you want to keep up to date on all the latest Star Trek news, lore, and more, then make sure you hit that subscribe button to never miss a video from the team here at Trek Central. You can also follow us on social media or join our community Discord server. But for now, lords, ladies, and sovereigns, click on ma tahash mashra nash. And may your deeds lead you to Stovokor. Kapla.